Welcome to this lecture on field programmable gate arrays and the course digital system design with PLDs and FPGAs. Uh, last lecture we have started with uh, the field programmable gate arrays. Um, at that point we kind of contrasted uh, the, the FPGA architecture over the, the CPLD. Uh, essentially we told the CPLD has a kind of a central uh, interconnecting switch between the logic blocks, um, but in FPGA this switch is distributed. So, the whole architecture is scalable and second feature of CPLD was very wide uh, product terms which is not required in practice that waste lot of area. So, in FPGA you have um, kind of lesser number of uh, inputs to the combination circuit. Uh, so, essentially uh, that is these two allow uh, the um, FPGA to scale to larger um, you know quite a complex size and we have seen uh, the evolution of FPGA from uh, ASIC to the, the standard cell to uh, the field programmable gate array what is in a nutshell what is the um, architecture of the FPGA a general architecture of FPGA and we have discussed uh, the programming uh, you know the technologies that means um, basically how uh, this configuration technology uh, what are the different type of uh, configuration technology and we have seen some commercial um, chips uh, commercial uh, devices from the, the major vendors ok. Uh, maybe th those are the only vendors uh, as far as uh, FPGAs are concerned. So, today we will uh, choose a specific F FPGA uh, the Xilinx um, FPGA and look detail into its architecture and which will basically enable you to tackle understand even the, the much more complex FPGAs from Xilinx itself as well as from um, other manufacturers because uh, most of the people use smart somewhat I would say somewhat uh, similar architecture unlike CPLD the, there are there are variations, but I will highlight I would um, highlight that uh, variation showing some examples wherever there is a kind of um, uh, drastic um, architecture variation ok. So, quickly we will have a look at the, the last lectures uh, slides then we will get on with today's lecture. So, let us move on to the slide. So, um, we looked at the evolution kind of a from a you know very low level design to using higher level blocks and interconnecting and the interconnection made at in the in the foundry, but in FPGA the interconnection is uh, with programmability is built into the gate uh, this array of logic resources so that it can be programmed or configured in the field. So, the game is between the, uh, the NRE cost which is very high for ASIC medium for this and low for this. Uh, so, this uh, ASIC work out for huge volumes and this for mid middle volume and this for low volume and the design turnaround time is very high for it and low for it. This may run into years and this could run into weeks uh, depending on uh, the complexity ok. Uh, apart from that then one should not kind of uh, go overboard we uh, definitely this uh, FPGA has um, disadvantages and um, it is quite it can be quite a complex FPGA can be quite quite uh, big and um, can be costly and one cannot assume uh, the you know uh, FPGA appearing in kind of uh, you know mass produce item like cell phones and all that. Um, but uh, nevertheless um, the, there is a definite role of FPGA in every um, digital chip design because almost all the chips are kind of um, implemented first in a field programmable gate array then moves to a, a ASIC um, almost all of them ok. And the FPGA as I said has an array of ok though uh, the name suggests array of gates, but that is not true. It is array of logic resources, it is a higher level logic resource 
which is used to build combinated circuit with programmable interconnection. And when we say logic resources, we know that we have to implement data path, we have to implement controllers. So, it has combination circuit and flip flops. When, we, when it comes to combination circuit, most of the FPGAs use lookup table as a combinational uh, circuit element and some uses multiplexers, some uses uh, gates and mainly I would say these are the um, the Actel and diffuse FPGAs which uses the multiplexes or gates and the programmable interconnection technologies are called SRAM an unfortunate name uh, flash and antifuse. There are special resources like phase lock loop, delay loop, lock loop, RAMs, FIFOs and memory controllers, network interfaces, processors and these are um, many a times depending on the requirement is uh, you know is part of the the silicon okay this is a hard coded um, devices which I am talking about okay. Uh, so that is field programmable gate in nutshell we have seen commercial FPGA Spartan and Vertex uh, uh, from Xilinx and Cyclone and Stratix and Aria from Altera and Actel has this uh, Pro ASIC plus and accelerator and radiation tolerant version of the accelerator smart fusion with arm core and things like that. And of course as, as I said the Silings has a sync with uh, dual core arm and uh, the, the Altera has soft core NEOS uh, processor. So this is the general structure of an FPGA IO pins around array of logic blocks normally this will run into tens and hundreds okay like across um, and um, across the row and across the column okay. So, this may be typical numbers will be for small one 50 by 50 to maybe uh, 100 by 100 and it may go all the way uh, to huge numbers okay. And um, that, that shows that you cannot interconnect those blocks with a single switch. So, there are wires laid out in a regular pattern. Uh, like at the junctions are the switches and the wires run. So, and these left and uh, the, the left and the bottom are the input to the logic block from these wires and the top and the right are the output and this is a very general I am not so talking about a specific FPGA, but maybe that a, a when you take a specific FPGA the input is from the bottom and the, and the uh, the output is from the right hand side and I, I have not verified uh, the chip layout um, it may not be available in the data sheet whether exactly uh, these are kind of schematic uh, you know when you look uh, very exactly it may not look exactly like that you know it very precisely in this fashion but uh, nevertheless it resembles uh, the implemented architecture. So, uh, you can imagine there are output coming there is a switch here where the output wires are connected to any of the wires here and you have a big switch here which allows the interconnection of these vertical bottom part or horizontal part left right and things like that. So, these are switches all junctions are switches which allows connection. So, um, when you put when a designer when the tool puts some hardware into FPGA it will be placed across multiple logic blocks and depending on uh, the circuits in the size uh, that will be interconnected using these general wires. There are wires which span a single logic block, there are wires which span maybe 2 logic blocks, 4 logic blocks, 6 um, and the one end to the other ok. Now these are these come from the statistics it depends on uh, what is inside a logic block and how many need to be interconnected how close you know in a for a, a normal circuit uh, you know uh, like in on an average it might be that uh, you take a 4 by 4 kind of matrix the, the mostly the connections uh, interconnections fall in here you know then um, some art you know in like you take this boundary then it on an average it goes all the way up to the 4th or 6th then such kind of wires are useful. Um, 
and as I said like um, when you interconnect there will be lot of switches programmed on the way. So, the interconnect delay in FPGA could be quite high compared to a CPLD, but the advantage of FPGA is the complexity itself um, a complex circuit can be implemented and this shows a very detailed uh, diagram where these are the switch block with uh, horizontal and vertical wire. So, this wire could be connected here, here or here and you can program all that and similarly output can be connected to any of the wires. There are 5 input going to the logic block and that can be you know connected to any of these wires. So, there are a lot of programmability and this is called configurable logic block because the logic block itself is quite big we will discuss why it is big. Uh, so, it need lot of configuration ok. So, that is uh, it and this shows a switch diagram like a, a horizontal wire vertical wire is connected to horizontal and um, you know this wire and this wire. So, at least uh, one wire is connected to left right and bottom and that this shows you know various different types of uh, connection depending on uh, the statistics which each vendors use um, different you know type of connections. Um, maybe we, we need not be seriously worried because our aim is to understand the FPGA and use it in our design than uh, design the FPGA. So, I will skip that and and this shows a diagram which which from the Silings data sheet which is very old, but this kind of um, you know uh, kind of highlight a uh, thing which we should not forget. There are logic blocks uh, which consists of combination circuit and the flip flops there are interconnect wires, but um, underlying is a configuration circuitry to configure all these. And so, uh, you should not forget about that there is lot of configuration overhead in terms of addressing these uh, switches and uh, programming it on off and all that. So, that makes uh, you know compared to an um, uh, normal ASIC uh, this makes um, uh, the FPGA quite big maybe it dissipates more power. So, the raw uh, the speed of an FPGA may, be, may not be as high as um, say 1 gig or 2 gig maybe the serial transceivers go at high speed because that is easy to design. But um, a general lookup table uh, speed may not be that high. So, any reasonable circuit you uh, you place in route it may not clock you know 1 gig maybe 200 megahertz 300 megahertz um, sometime if it is too complex uh, if you are not floor planning it properly it might even go down sub 100. So, but then um, it is it's not a processor. So, you can um, it is up to the designer to exploit um, the, the available resources and you know do parallel computing. Uh, you know pipelining and so on and, and kind of uh, implement um, a very high throughput uh, design uh, to exploit this um, available resources ok. That is how with FPGA one achieve performances. So, uh, FPGA consists of IO blocks and that has tri state output and input and uh, it has a synchronizing flip flop because the uh, input can come from another chip or another clock domain and there are array of configurable logic blocks. There are horizontal vertical wires with programmable switches in between. These wires are single length, double length, quad, hex and long lines. Uh, it depends on as I said statistics of how spread is the, the, the circuit or the connections and there are resources available to the user in terms of logic blocks. Uh, the memory, uh, the, the PLLs and all that and there are resources for configuring the programmable switches in the interconnect structures and logic blocks ok. We will see what is uh, what is there to configure in a logic block and this is where we have stopped. Uh, the, the programmable technologies are SRAM, flash and anti fuse and we said that the SRAM basically use a transistor and most transistor for interconnecting uh, the two wires, but then uh, the 
if the gate is like if it is an NMOS transistor if gate is 1 it makes a connection gate is 0 it, it cut off the connection ok. Now at the gate is a is a flip flop which holds that um, that status of the connection if the flip flop is set to 1 then it conducts if it is 0 it does not conduct. So that means that these flip flops you know all these are flip flops uh, which need to be programmed at the power on because at the power on uh, there is no specific state uh, now to, to program it now it, like it is too much of an overhead to kind of independently address uh, and you know program it. So you do not program it serially you program it you know parallel. So this flip flops are organized as a static RAM of width 8 or 16 bit and the vendor knows the, the kind of the position to uh, decide on the format of the configuration file and that is why it is called SRAM ok. When you say uh, the, the programming technology is SRAM no way SRAM can interconnect something but uh, the pass transfer is the interconnect technology. Uh, the flip flops are used to store the status of the gate and flip flops are you know organized as static RAM to ease of programming. So in the previous um, families of FPGAs um, it was 8 bit wide and the current FPGAs use 16 bit wide programming and that I am telling the, the kind of uh, the row internal structure but then uh, there is a way to program serially as far as the user is concerned we will we will we will see that ok. So what one issue with the SRAM is that this is a single flip flop ok. So you you look at this this whole uh, block ok. Um, now uh, I hope you, you you remember that this is a logic cell this is a logic cell these four are logic cell and these are the horizontal wires these are the vertical wires. So we are talking about interconnection at this big switches and the output interconnecting to the to the vertical wire ok. Just an explanation on the diagram. Now we are looking at this we are blowing it up this one. So we have a right transistor I mean we have a, a kind of switch uh, which is a transistor and a flip flop ok. So that is what is shown here you have a switch the gate of that is connected to a flip flop which is nothing but in cross connected uh, inverters ok. So and now you have to force this inverter to 1 or 0 so this is a right transistor suppose you want to force this to 0 then you what you do is that you put a 1 here enable the right transistor the, it, this is forced to 1 so 1 uh, this becomes 0 and 0 comes here it is latched and that can be removed. That means you give a 1 you give a pulse here then it gets latched on to the, the flip flop and the pass transistor is on or off depending on what you give here ok. Only thing is that you give uh, the opposite of what you want as far as the, the structure is concerned. Um, important thing to remember is that the flip flop uh, are made of 2 inverters and one inverter is made of 2 transistors 1 NMOS and 1 PMOS, PMOS to the VDD, NMOS to the ground. So that this, this inverter is, is composed of 2 transistors this 2 and this one is you know the 2 plus 2 5 and 6. And this can be sometime a right transfer with isolation can be big. So one switch means 6 uh, transistors ok. So you can imagine it, it occupies quite a lot of area. So uh, if you assume say here it is shown um, 7 wires. So if it is a 7 into 4 28 wires even if one wire is connected to 3 you know you like um, you can say 28. C2 kind of uh, connections are available for it to, to, to connect to everything else. So it is a, it's a quite, quite a 28 into 27 by 2 uh, connections may be there you know. So um, and uh, that involves lot of transistors into 6. So these switches occupies quite a lot of area. So that is one kind of disadvantage of um, um, the SRAM kind of technology that the switches occupy lot of area 
and of course there is a delay because once you uh, there is a delay of the the channel okay so it introduces each switch introduces a certain delay so when you cascade multiple switches uh, from source to destination it adds to the delay and it occupies a lot of area and these as i said this whole thing is organized as sram cells you know of certain width uh, hence it is called the static ram technology and when it comes to mos transfer we have seen that um, with respect to the the pldes cpldes and mos transfer as a, a it's a normal mos transfer with a floating gate it conducts when it is not programmed off and it can be electrically programmed off or on we have seen uh, the kind of s basic um, working of it so you have an n uh, you know n channel transistor n mos transistor with n source n drain p substrate um you have silicon oxide a polysilicon gate then again silicon oxide the controlling gate now normal case you apply the positive voltage channel forms and conducts but the trick is to trap some electrons here to make the threshold voltage quite high so if you apply normal threshold voltage because electrons are sitting here and kind of uh, you need a higher field to form the channel okay so uh, that makes it off you know even if you apply the the control gate uh, with a with a logic high it doesn't conduct so that is how it is turned off so that is shown here the source is grounded drain is given the supply voltage a pulse is applied a higher voltage pulse is applied so electron tunnels and get in here and then uh, the normal application of the the gate voltage wouldn't make the channel and it wouldn't conduct and when you want to erase it you do the opposite you ground it the gate you ground you apply a pulse here it gets out so one advantage of the flash is that it can be programmed on or off electrically and much more than the if the chip has a port for doing that um within the circuit you can program it so um somebody makes an fpga or a cpld with that technology on the board on the on the at the destination it can be kind of and uh, it can be updated and nowadays um more and more kind of over the network update or sometimes it's called over the air update through the wireless channel uh, the firmware is updated and maybe even the hardware uh, many a times can be uh, you know the the updated like if you have a programmable hardware not only the flash memory is the programmable hardware also can be uh, you know updated remotely uh, through the network wireless and all that so these technologies enable that and the third one is called anti fuse or anti fuse and um, you know that in a chip design you have layers uh, which implements the transistor and you have layers with interconnecting wires okay so you cannot have the wires in the same layer as the transistor so they are on a different layer and the layer to layer connection is by drilling a hole and normally on one layer the wires will run horizontal in the next layer the wires will run vertically okay because uh you know it's easy to interconnect also the kind of the the like uh, the coupling between the two tracks will be less the capacitance between the tracks will be less so essentially if this is assumed that this is a horizontal wire this is a vertical wire normally they'll at the cross point there'll be a hole drill and that will be conducting it is made conducting okay so in an anti fuse fpgas the connection is made through this hole initially the hole won't be conducting uh there will be a fuse material a special fuse material deposited it shows a cross section of that and uh normally it is not conducting this shows the kind of the horizontal wire on the top layer and this shows a vertical wire which is kind of coming out of the screen uh towards you so there is a a kind of um, hole with a proper deposit and you apply a high voltage when i say high voltage like a kind of nearing 10 volt and then it fuses and make a connection okay which is permanent which cannot be kind of erased okay so that has certain advantage so it doesn't kind of a, a noise wouldn't 
uh, reverse the status of connection once it is programmed. So these kind of technologies are used in the space application uh, mostly so that anything sent to outer space is exposed to a lot of radiation and this can kind of uh, flips the flip flops and uh, that can cause problems. So the anti fuse is used and it is not very kind of a uh, little bit um, you say resistant to the reverse engineering if somebody try to kind of um, peel the chip and take the, the photograph of the mask then one cannot make out the hole is kind of programmed on or off. So that is an additional protection from kind of piracy the hardware piracy uh, as far as this is concerned. But in SRAM kind of FPGAs you know that uh, these uh, the status of these flip flops has to be stored somewhere and at the power on it can, has to be programmed and if somebody can read those memories uh, then uh, this design can be pirated. Um, but nowadays there are encryption technologies which is available to protect the, the configuration file which is stored in a memory okay. But uh, this has an additional advantage of that the summary is shown here. So in a flash kind of uh, technology it is non volatile once you program it till you erase it it retains it's good that way it is reprogrammable in circuit and the delay is quite large area is medium. But when it comes to SRAM uh, it is volatile that means at the power on uh, it has to be reprogrammed. But then um, you know that uh, the flash has some kind of limitation on the number of times you can program. Um, it is not that it kind of um, it is a serious limitation as far as FPGA is concerned is not that when you design with FPGA you program it 1000 times a day uh, because it takes time to design and uh, the designers do a lot of simulation and verify everything before going to the to the chip to program the chip. Uh, but still uh, that SRAM uh, has no such uh, great limitation that number of times it can be programmed. So uh, this is very good for prototyping and particularly I would say coming from academic institution it is very good to give it to the students you know. Uh, they can program reprogram and it runs for quite a long you know you can use it for 3 years 4 years without trouble. So this is also in insecure reprogrammable delay is large area is large we have seen the large area. When you say anti fuse um, it is non volatile it is one time it is not reprogrammable. But you see the delay is small because it is not through a a you know active circuit like transistor it is a connection it is it is a fuse connection and the area is no extra area like uh, there anyway the interconnection of the wires require uh, the wires which is called wires or vias so the hole and so this deposit is in that vias okay. So uh, there is no additional area but definitely to apply the voltage you need a, a transistor to isolate that voltage so definitely there, there has to be right transistors at that place but still it does not occupy much area. Now this has some effect uh, this programming technology has some effect on the, uh, the size of the, uh, the logic block okay. So uh, this is one important thing though, though nowadays most um, the complex FPGAs are SRAM. So, this is kind of forgotten but then one should realize that um, when you take say an anti fuse based FPGA uh, since uh, the, the area of the interconnection is very less they are able to make the logic block small okay. So this is something to do with the kind of fragmentation like you, you would have seen in a hard disk uh, say there are sectors okay. Nowadays you have um, uh, you know the the terabytes or gigabytes of uh, you know the space on the hard disk but there are basic units you know it is not that uh, the hard disk can accommodate byte wide uh, storage it is a sector wide storage and earlier uh, the sectors were 5 12 bytes but now it is kind of 4k 8k uh, depending on the, the size of the uh, total size of the hard disk. Now, 
advantage of choosing small size is that less space is wasted. Suppose uh, the sector size is a, a 4K okay. Suppose on an average uh, the uh, the files have less less than 4K size okay. Suppose 60 percent of the files stored in a hard disk is, is uh, less than 4K then lot of area is wasted. So, there we can say there is fragmentation or unused area in each sector. So, um, this choosing the size of the sector depends on the average size of the, the file. So, uh, it will be ideal if you can choose it very small enough so that nothing is wasted you know. Uh, like if it is make 5 12 bytes uh, the, the, you know, the, the maximum waste will be 5 12 bytes maybe if there is a file which is very small. So, only 5 12 is wasted but then uh, in the case of uh, in 4K the 4K can be wasted you know for a very small file um, or uh, there is a there is a file which is just little above the 4K so that um, that might affect. So, that I am talking about the fragmentation same argument those coming back to the slide same argument applies here um, you know in a fine grain the, the fragmentation will be less. But um, that is possible because the interconnection uh, area is small, but when you use an FPGA with the SRAM which occupies lot of area, uh, if you make the, the logic block very small to avoid uh, the kind of uh, wastage within the logic uh, block, then um, the, the switches will be much bigger than the logic block okay. So, what um, this kind of FPGA vendor you do is that they make the logic block quite big because interconnection is costly. So, they make make sure that quite a lot of things are packed into the FPGA, but then there is a great danger that uh, only part of it is used. So, the uh, this kind of FPGA which is called coarse grain FPGA and the second type is called fine grain. The coarse grain FPGA the vendors make sure that the logic blocks are very flexible that means that they make sure that everything can be used. Suppose you are using a part of a logic block uh, other part can be used say we, we have seen the CPLD. Uh, in a CPLD the AND and OR section output goes to a flip flop okay or in a PLD like 22 V10. So, you can bypass the flip flop there is no, no problem okay. So, but if you bypass the flip flop that flip flop cannot be used separately okay. So, uh, so that is a waste okay. But in, in you will we will see soon see that in an FPGA uh, the FPGA vendors make sure that like if the combination logic alone is used in a particular logic block the flip flop can be separately used for something else you know these kind of things are available. That is how they exploit uh, the kind of disadvantage of the the, the large size of the static RAM and um, most I can say they are successful in doing that uh, they are not bogged down by that. So, though there is a division uh, there is no great disadvantage with the coarse screen kind of architecture okay. That is what, what I want to highlight I will just show a picture this is a coarse screen FPGA basically a Xilinx FPGA. You can see that it is a logic block configurable logic block. There are two identical slices and they call it slice and within a slice there are identical uh, blocks two blocks and there is a lookup table four input and flip flops. So, a logic block has four lookup table and four flip flop okay. So, and um, this lookup table itself is four input which allows you to implement uh, four input uh, variable implementation. So, it is quite uh, this is quite huge okay it is coarse grain and we will see. Uh, this in detail later and if you take this is a taken from a Altera sorry Actel FPGA Actel 54X okay I should have shown that. Uh, so, this is taken from uh, the, the Actel uh, data sheet um, the 54X um, FPGA. So, you see the essential combination circuit is a 4 to 1 multiplexer okay. You know that the multiplexer is nothing but AND or circuit and if you want to implement a boolean function it is possible say you connect a variable a here b here then this line represent a bar b bar a b bar a bar b sorry a bar b a b bar 
and AB ok. So depending on like you want to have an AB bar or A bar B say you choose 0 1 1 0 then you get that implementation. So uh, uh, this is how you know it is a very simple you know two variable but uh, in this case there is an AND gate with two inputs OR gate with uh, you know two inputs. So uh, normally if you want two then you connect one to the logic one other uses variable but in some cases like you give A, B, C, D then uh, you know some combination of product terms of uh, 5 variables are possible. And you, you also remember that if you connect an A, B and instead of giving 1, 0 here if you connect a third variable here like C, C bar and so on you could make 3 variable implementation. So uh, with this you know like a 1 variable here and 4 here maybe some uh, combination of 5 variable can be implemented otherwise 3 variable implementation can be uh, done. So that is a fine grain um, you know logic cell of an FPGA. So design methodology we have uh, discussed this during the, the VHDL lecture but then if you have not gone through that lecture for some reason um, you are looking at the FPGA part of the lectures then we will just illustrate that. So the design methodology is currently uh, you start with a hardware description language like VHDL or Verilog. You describe your circuit in uh, VHDL or Verilog. After that you simulate that it is called functional simulation. Sometime people call it behavioral simulation. Uh, these are just named. Sometime people say the behavioral simulation is nothing but functional simulation plus the timing details but nevertheless you know I mean uh, by functional simulation uh, the, the basic code is simulated ok. Now that is not the circuit you are simulating when you say um, say Y is assigned A and B uh, we are not simulating uh, the AND gate we are just simulating that AND function ok. So uh, there is no circuit here this is the basic source code it is very fast because if you make syntax errors we are you make logical errors that can be quickly corrected at this point uh, before you know generating the circuit. So uh, that is that functional simulation then you go to a step called synthesis ok wherein this um, the source code you have written is synthesized into a net list of logic gates and flip flops maybe it is boolean equation in the case of uh, you know the combination circuit. But uh, it is the a logic circuit is generated out of your description. Now uh, if you are a novice if the designer is a novice uh, he or she can go for a logic simulation uh, that is different from this functional simulation because here we are simulating the logic which is generated by the synthesis tool. Here you are you know simulating the code you are written the, the code in human readable English that that syntax is simulated here. But here the logic is simulated but mind you at this point or here there are no delays because there is it is not yet implemented in a device. So there is no delay at this point. So you give uh, to an AND gate A and B at 10 nanosecond uh, the Y which is the output come out at the 10 nanosecond ok. So no logic uh, delay or interconnect delay so there is no delay here. But mind you here you are simulating the code here you are simulating the circuit without delay and maybe you can if you simulate that if you find errors if there is synthesis errors then you can go back and iterate. So you iterate here you iterate here but for a, an expert designer who knows coding uh, which I have taught you in, in the case of VHDL knowing a particular circuit how to write the proper VHDL code so that you get what you want you know then in that case you really do not require this logic simulation. And then you go to a step called place and route that is basically um, like going back to this diagram maybe uh, like you have maybe S yes here. Uh, you, you, the synthesis tool will generate a logic circuit now the FPG has an array of logic blocks. Now that circuit and these are identical arrays and that circuit has to be placed in the logic block and has to be interconnected and that is not a 
very easy task because if you take a logic one logic block the first logic some some circuit you have synthesized a part of the circuit uh, like if there are kind of 10,000 or 100,000 logic block uh, you could place it anywhere without any constraint if, if there is no constraint uh, the possibilities are too high uh, so the place uh, that is you know the placing the circuit in a logic block and in reconnecting it okay that, that is called routing. So that is what it says. So this is this is what the place and route and at that point you know like uh, the FPGA is a kind of general purpose circuit uh, the IO pins you know the your user input output signal can be assigned to any IO pin. So you can specify the IO constraints saying that uh, you know you please map you know map this particular signal to so and so pin because maybe one advantage of FPGA is that uh, even before designing the chip you can start with the, the PCB design like you can assign the pin of the chip to a particular uh, signal and you can go ahead with the PCB design while you are designing the chip okay. Ultimately some kind of a printed circuit board has to be used to mount this uh, FPGA so that can go parallel. So these IO pin assignment is specified in the constraint and another thing which can be specified is that as I said the placement is a very critical thing to do complex thing to do. Suppose you want some performance you want to like you designed a counter with the flip flops and next side logic and you are planning to clock the counter at say 300 megahertz then if the counter flip flops are kind of placed apart in the, in the chip you know like you uh, maybe uh, the chip uh, okay the chip um, we will come back to the chip diagram um, okay here. So suppose a part of the counter is here another part is here. So uh, for the counter it has to be interconnected so it may not like it, it incurs lot of delay. It will be good if they are placed close together so that uh, the interconnection would not suffer lot of delay uh, so that you, you, you will get a faster counter. So that kind of uh, constraints called timing constraints can be specified at this point which say that um, for a combinatorial circuit from an input uh, to a particular output the delay should be less than certain uh, you know time like uh, 5 nanosecond uh, for 200 megahertz um, or you can say from a register to through a combination circuit to the other register which includes all the delay TCQ, uh, T combinational, T wire delay, T switch delay and the setup time everything. It should be less than 5 nanosecond. Then the place and route tool will make sure that uh, the circuits concerned are placed together in, in close together and the number of interconnecting switches are less and so on okay. So it can iterate over that. So it is when you say constraint you know you have the timing constraint, the IO constraint all that is there. Then the, the place and route tool which is called PAR uh, tool you know do the place and routing. Many a times in the case of PLDs it is called fitting okay. So basically it is just a term used you could uh, in principle use the term place and route there also but then you know that there is only a, there is no variation there is no great there is a single switch between the logic block. So it is basically the you know how to fit the, the given circuit into the uh, into the logic block is the main concern so that is why it is called fitting and once you do that then at this point. Uh, for the tool um, all the delays are done in the all the combination circuit delay all the wire delay all the register delay all the IO delay everything is known. So a timing model is generated now you can simulate uh, the, the your synthesized and place and route circuit with time delays and you give an input you can the output come with a delay you know so you do the timing simulation. Uh, so you should know that this, this, this are different. This is the original VHDL code you have written you do the functional simulation. This is the synthesized code 
uh, which itself may be written in VHDL uh, which is simulated. So, the language may be VHDL, but that is not the, the code you have written and when it comes here still can be a VHDL code uh, many a times Verilog is used, uh, but with the for certain reason uh, for the timing uh, model uh, with the time delays uh, this, this can be you know uh, in the same language, but totally different code. So, that is timing simulated, but then it takes a long time. One thing to understand is that you give the input then uh, the simulator has to now calculate all the time delays uh, which is composed of lot of uh, you know individual time delay in between it is not a gross time. So, it is a time of a uh, the IO, IO delay, interconnect delay, wire delays and the lookup table the combination circuit delay uh, various uh, combination circuit components everything had to delay. So, there is quite a lot of uh, the computation to do. So, this can be very uh, the timing simulation can be very time consuming ok. So, for a complex circuit it might take a day uh, to simulate that and, and uh, so at the beginning like when you start when you do the first iteration of the place and route if you go for timing simulation and find you know it, you take 6 hours to simulate and find a small error then come back and correct is a very very hard thing to do. So, there is something called timing analysis which is static timing analysis done. So, this is dynamic in the sense that you give the input you literally uh, you know make the circuits work from the input to output. But here what is done is that um, this tool will look at the, the block delay interconnect delay and estimate the time from input to output uh, for a combinate circuit or for register to register for a uh, data path or sequential circuit ok. But the problem is that there are no inputs ok, no inputs are specified. Uh, so, the state machine or the controllers are not active. What is available is set of registers uh, combination circuit set of registers and it adds up all, all possible paths and show up the delay ok. Now, it may make mistake you know it might um, report a path from a register to another register which is never used in the real circuit in real life ok. So, because uh, you know that the controller is the one which is controlling the data path. Maybe there are 4 source registers some combination circuit and say 5 destination register. The real operation of the circuit only involve a, like a kind of one to one mapping maybe one register um, result goes to the other register 4 of them and maybe one of the register give the result uh, to the 2 registers you know some time to one and some time to other. But uh, if you give on to a static timing analysis tool it does not know all that because it has no idea of the signal uh, kind of signal status ok, control signal status. So, what it assumes is that 4 source 5 destination total possible paths are 20, but in real life is only 5 and it will report all the timing from source to destination of all the 20 paths. And you might as a designer you might find that uh, you know 6 of them is violating the timing constraints you have put ok. But the none of it may be used in the real life circuit. So, you can be kind of misled uh, in this game. So, it is very important that when one do the static timing analysis such information is given to the tool saying that what are the paths valid ok. Like there could be another situation where there is a source register and destination register. The destination is not clocked uh, you know kind of um, every clock like the source get an input data, but the result get latched after 2 clock cycle. But this uh, that is enabled through the uh, enable of the destination register through a state machine or a controller which the timing analysis tool have no way to know. So, it will assume that uh, all the registers are working all the time you know uh, upon uh, upon every clock head. So, it will assume you know it will overestimate uh, the critical path delay and there could be error. So, this has to be told to the timing analysis tool then it will be very fast. So, after the, the place and route uh, one do the static timing analysis if that is not met you iterate back now. Maybe you go back change the constraint you do certain change in the the synthesis options 
uh, whatever is uh, the correct option or even go back and modify the circuit. And once everything is done you do the timing simulation again go back maybe this way up to here or up to here iterate it. When everything is done when the designer is satisfied a configuration file is generated that you can program uh, the chip ok. So that is what is in a typical tool there can be more tools more advanced tool but at least uh, bare minimum tools required for FPGA design is that you have a editor, editor which can be internal or external a synthesis tool, um, the place and route tool or a fitting tool, a programming tool, a constrained editor, a simulator which can do the functional simulation, logic simulation and timing simulation. Normally any simulator will do support all these uh, three and a static timing analysis tool. So and many a times the vendors give everything put together as a single uh, kind of integrated uh, design environment. So IDE um, the Xilinx call it ICE integrated um, system environment or uh, uh, things like that ICE ISE and uh, sometime some of these tools like there are um, vendors who give very good synthesis tool alone ok. And the vendors allow you to use that synthesis tool um, along with their you know the tool instead of you can replace the the synthesis tool which is supplied by the, the vendor and replace it with uh, a third party synthesis tool and so on. But normally the place and route is done by the vendor because the vendor knows the, the, uh, the FPGA internal details which is very much required for properly doing that. And many times it is not wise to give out this detail because people can make out um, what is really inside though we are we have the data sheet but all the details are not exposed uh, for you know keep the intellectual property. So uh, that is uh, the design methodology and if you look at the commercial tool just to give a flavor and this is um, the recording in 2014 January I am not sure that uh, after 2 years if you listen to this lecture these tools uh, will remain or these some companies some industry vendors are given in the bracket you know that maybe one is acquired by somebody else I have no guarantee. But as on now as on 2014 January uh, you have the, the model sim simulator from Mender Graphics which is a very good simulator. Similarly you have active HTL simulator from ALDEC these are good simulator but the vendors have their own uh, simulators. And synthesis tool you have Simplify Pro from Synopsys very good synthesis tool, a precision synthesis from Mender Graphics. But when it comes to vendors you know the Silings ICE or ISE it has everything you know you have synthesis, simulation, power programming, uh, static timing analysis, constraint editor, power analysis, the floor planning uh, you know name it everything is there. And these ICE tool work up to the chips of the family. Uh, Spartan 6 and Vertex 6 but for Vertex 7 they have a different tool much more kind of better tool called Silinx Vivado very good tool um, a quantum leap in the in the whole uh, tool technology. This is quite old but this is quite new and good but it is only now currently supporting the, uh, the Vertex 7 series maybe as, as the years come by this may disappear and this alone will there will be there and Altera has quarters to once again that has everything everything what you need whatever the Silinx tools are there everything is there. Actor Libero is again um, same they have everything required for um, a, a kind of um, uh, for the FPGA design their family of FPGAs. Now if you are a normal uh, novice designer you are starting with small uh, kind of um, projects then what you need is only this. But if you are doing very complex thing and you are able to you want very high performance you want very high tight fitting a, you know kind of reduction in power uh, you know the, the, the you want a refinement in the area of the implementation then you need to use these kind of things. 
and uh, these tools are these vendor tools are improving uh, say compared to 5 years back the, the current tools are really really good and you do not need to probably use the third party tool but that is up to you to make a judgment you know what you do is that you evaluate like if you have a really if you feel that you are not getting the performance you want you have done everything under the earth to get the performance but uh, you need little more performance then you can probably uh, move from the vendor uh, to a third party synthesis tool um, to, to get the performance out of it. So um, of course you know when coming to the, uh, the, the other tools we have the, the major VLSI designers you know you have the Cadence, Synopsis, Mender. Uh, these are basically the synthesis tool and uh, the, the simulator very good simulator. Uh, but then you have to definitely do the place and route uh, with the vendor tool you know these also support. So uh, maybe I think I thought of going further but then it is good that you know a good introduction uh, gives you a good grip on the, on the subject. We will see the internal details of the Xilinx Vertex FPGA I am taking that as an example. So what we have seen today is the programmable interconnect technology SRAM, uh, the flash and anti fuse a kind of uh, features what is the advantage disadvantage and we have seen how this forces a coarse grain and fine grain kind of architecture and how the coarse grain people uh, the vendors make sure that nothing is wasted and we have looked at uh, the, uh, the design methodology what are the steps uh, the tool flow in, in designing FPGAs we have seen some commercial tool. Now I think um, I have touched upon all the all the introductory material to get a very good grip and we will go detail into we will take an architecture vertex architecture which is not used at all but it is a very good starting point once you understand that any other complex FPG architecture can be understood very nicely. Uh, so we will go in into details very very much into details of the, uh, the vertex FPG architecture. So, Please uh, now on your part you can go through my slide you can also read the, the data sheets of the vendor, the application notes from the vendor there are a lot of material which is available. Maybe the textbook uh, are not the ideal place to learn FPGA from very do not waste your time on um, most of the textbook I have not frankly followed up but then you can use a lot of the data sheets and so on. So we will see in the next lecture the details of the FPGA. I wish you all the best and thank you.